Hi there, I'm sharing my story here partly as a vent and also because I haven't fully moved on from it yet. I, 23M, unfortunately crossed paths with Jane, 20F, on a dating app. Personally, I've always viewed dating apps as unrealistic for finding a life partner, given the horror stories my friends have shared. Most people seem to use them for casual hookups. My own curiosity led me to join, just to see if I had any game. Back to the story, Jane and I hit it off right away. We clicked so well that the so-called three-day rule didn't apply. We were texting consistently from the start. After a few days, we swapped numbers and continued chatting on Telegram. I reminded myself not to set any expectations, considering we'd met online, but I couldn't help but wonder where things might go. Getting to know her was a joy. We discovered we had a lot in common and it was genuinely exciting. Only two days into texting, she suggested a movie date, knowing we were both movie enthusiasts. I eagerly agreed, looking forward to watching The Flash together, her favorite superhero. Our first date was a bit awkward, but we laughed it off and went on multiple dates afterward. Feelings started to develop gradually. Although we never defined our relationship with a title, we both knew it was exclusive. We simply enjoyed each other's company without dwelling on labels. Of course, there were some misunderstandings along the way, but we navigated through them. Unfortunately, after a few disagreements, I began to see Jane's true colors. Some might call them red flags. For instance, I was always the one initiating plans, and I often found myself taking the high road in arguments. She would say hurtful things, but I believed in being forgiving and mature, even during tough times. Looking back, I realized I was giving that energy to someone who didn't appreciate it. Then came a turning point. Jane went overseas for a school trip, just a two-week stint. Little did I know, those two weeks would be tumultuous. We found ourselves arguing constantly, mainly because she seemed disinterested in my daily experiences and only wanted to talk about hers. I tried explaining my feelings several times, but she couldn't understand, leading to heated arguments. Feeling overwhelmed, I asked for space and told her I'd reach out when I felt better. She agreed and wished me well. After two days of trying to calm myself down, I finally decided to text her. However, she replied hours later, which was unusual because she's always glued to her phone. We're in the same time zone, so I figured she must be busy. But when she did reply after eight hours, it was a cold response. My gut feeling told me something was wrong. I had this sinking feeling in my stomach. I couldn't shake off the sense of dread. So, I re-downloaded the dating app we met on and, unfortunately, saw that she was online. We had agreed to delete the app together when things got serious, so seeing her online was devastating. My heart sank and my chest felt tight. It was hard to breathe. I think I was having a panic attack. I tried calling her to ask what was going on, but she didn't pick up. I called multiple times, desperate for answers, but she still didn't answer. So, I decided to wait until she returned from her trip to confront her in person. While waiting for her, I couldn't stop overthinking and spiraling. Nasty thoughts filled my head as I imagined what she might have been doing overseas. After a few days of ignoring me, she finally texted back and agreed to meet in person. I knew what was coming, so I told myself to stay calm and respectful when I saw her. When she returned, we met up. She filled me in on what I had missed while we weren't talking before I asked her what was wrong. She confessed that she has issues with detachment. She admitted that she should have felt affected by my absence, but she wasn't. While I needed space, she took the time to reflect and realize that she had been heartless in her treatment of me. I couldn't be mad because I felt she was being honest. I respected everything she said. Then, I asked her why she went back on the dating app and she seemed taken aback. It took her a moment to process my question before she denied it. I told her I saw her online because I had downloaded the app again to check, and there she was. She eventually admitted that she was back on the dating app, and her reason infuriated me. She claimed she downloaded it out of boredom and was only swiping on guys without talking to them. I knew it was nonsense, and I pressed her on whether she was confident about what she said. She insisted she was. So, I challenged her to show me the app. She then claimed she had already deleted it. I told her to re-download it, and she complied. 
Interestingly, when she attempted to log in, she couldn't, and she made a deliberate show of it in front of me. She tried multiple times, but it wouldn't work. What she didn't realize was that she had turned off the data for the app. I played along and acted like it was okay. In my mind, her willingness to go to such lengths indicated she was hiding something. I thought it was best not to know the truth because I didn't know how I would react. So, I remained calm and said, it's okay. I hope one day you'll realize what I've done for you and be grateful. Today isn't that day. But when you do see everything, please don't come back and apologize because I've already forgiven you. My intentions with you were always genuine. I hope you find what you're looking for, and please don't treat the next guy the way you treated me. Take care. It was painful to say those words, knowing I had been betrayed. She teared up during my speech, and despite wanting to cry myself, I managed to remain composed. After witnessing her fake tears, I hugged her, left, and we haven't spoken since. It's been months, and I'm still devastated by the betrayal. I would appreciate any advice from strangers here on how to properly move on from this. All the best. Story 2 My wife and I have been married for 7 years, together for 10, and our marriage has been wonderful until recently. We've had our occasional disagreements like any couple, but overall, it's been loving, fulfilling, and happy for both of us. We still share an active and healthy sex life, although not as frequently as before. She's truly amazing, beautiful, smart, funny, and I take pride in providing for us. While I work 40 to 60 hours per week, she works part-time as a professor at a community college and also teaches yoga, which is her passion. About four months ago, I was shocked when I looked through her email and found an exchange with a man I didn't recognize. They were exchanging sexually explicit messages and videos of their affair. I was blindsided and overwhelmed with emotions. I took some time to compose myself and plan before confronting her. I packed a bag and prepared to leave for the night to sort things out on my own. When I confronted her, she immediately broke down, admitting to the affair and apologizing profusely. I was upset and told her I would find another place to stay. She begged and pleaded for me to stay, calling me nonstop while I stayed with my brother. After two weeks, I missed her and decided to go home to reconcile. I asked her how she could do this to me, and she could only reply with I don't know or it just happened. I later found out that he was a 27-year-old professor at her college who had started working in her department a few months prior. She promised to earn back my trust and came up with a plan, including cutting ties with the guy, changing jobs, allowing me to track her phone and car, giving me access to her email accounts, getting an STD test, and going to therapy. I could sense her deep remorse and desire to reconcile. Since then, she has been grateful for the opportunity, fulfilled her end of the agreement, and has generally been a pleasant and loving person to be around. However, rebuilding trust has been a challenge. Despite the progress we've made in our relationship, I find myself unable to shake the constant pain and torment caused by thoughts of my wife's affair. The memories of those videos are etched into my mind, overwhelming me with feelings of pain, humiliation, and embarrassment. This has significantly hindered our progress as a couple, as I've harbored a lot of resentment towards my wife because of it. Their sexual encounters were completely unprotected, and he was well endowed. They engaged in activities that we, as a married couple, have never done, like wearing different lingerie and enthusiastically performing oral sex on him, which feels like a chore when she does it for me. What hurts the most is that she engaged in anal sex with him and swallowed his semen, even though those were two things I had asked her about in our relationship, and she always found them gross or degrading. It's difficult to express how degraded she appeared in those videos. It sickens me to think of the disgusting things she did, like licking his anus or performing oral sex immediately after anal. But what hurts the most is that she seemed more enthusiastic about all of it than she ever has been about our sex life in the past 10 years. I've asked her why she did those things with him and why she refused them with me, but her answer is always I don't know. I'm constantly torn apart, seeking an answer to this question. Needless to say, my self-esteem has taken a hit. I witnessed firsthand that this man turned her on more than I ever have, and she had a much stronger desire to please him. This has caused intimacy problems between us ever since. Since her answer is always I don't know, 
I can't help but wonder if it's because my penis is too small, if I'm too weak, or if I'm an inadequate lover. These thoughts and feelings have caused so much emotional turmoil and built up resentment towards my wife. Despite her strong efforts, my feelings don't seem to diminish or lose intensity. I'd like to know if anyone else has experienced a similar problem. Is it fair to myself or my wife to keep trying to work things out? Any help would be greatly appreciated because I feel like I'm at my wit's end. Story 3 A few weeks ago, I learned from my wife's sister that six years ago, my wife had confessed to her about sleeping with her best friend while drunk. This revelation shook me to the core. Immediately after hearing this, I took a paternity test with the child I thought was mine. Unfortunately, the results confirmed my suspicions. He wasn't biologically mine. This discovery changed everything. I couldn't help but see the child differently, more like an acquaintance than a son. Armed with the test results, I confronted my wife that night while the child was asleep. She demanded to know who told me, but I refused to disclose the source, although it wouldn't take her long to figure it out. Despite her pleas and apologies, I initiated divorce proceedings. She claimed to have been faithful since then, blaming alcohol for her past actions rather than taking responsibility. During our conversation, she threatened to pursue full custody of the child. Fed up, I agreed, stating that I wanted nothing to do with a child who wasn't biologically mine. I insisted that she keep the child while I would keep our two dogs, whom we had adopted together years ago. She then tried to persuade me to co-parent with her, emphasizing that I was still the child's father. Frustrated and angry, I snapped and told her to leave with her child. It's been a week since the incident, and I've been at home, which is in my name as it was a gift from my parents. My wife took our child to her parents' house after I yelled at her. It was the first time I raised my voice like that, and it seemed to affect her deeply. She hasn't reached out to me since then, and she left with everything, including our half-asleep child. I've talked to my parents about the situation, and my dad reassured me that I made the right decision. He emphasized that I shouldn't be responsible for raising a child that isn't biologically mine, and I agree. However, the pain lingers. My younger brother suggested I share my thoughts here to distract myself. I'm currently seeing a therapist three times a week who believes that I've taken the first step by removing myself from what causes me pain. It's just difficult knowing that my family, as I knew it, no longer exists. As for why my sister-in-law disclosed everything, she expressed feeling guilty seeing me blissfully unaware with my son, knowing there was a possibility he wasn't biologically mine. She mentioned that our visit during a moment of vulnerability prompted her to confront her guilt. I'm not sure how true her explanation is, but right now, I harbor intense resentment towards my wife and conflicting emotions of pain and resentment towards the child. Nonetheless, I know I need to move forward. I'm hopeful that the divorce process will be smooth. We have separate finances and properties, and if my wife seeks child support, I have evidence proving the child isn't biologically mine, which my lawyer assured me is sufficient to address any legal challenges. My therapist advised me to prioritize my own well-being and refrain from seeing the child or my wife. Despite the child's feelings, I need to focus on my own healing journey, accepting that the child is no longer my responsibility. Story 4 my girlfriend and I have been together for four years and sharing a rented apartment for two. Yesterday, we attended a party where we both had some drinks and enjoyed ourselves. There was a guy at the party who would approach random women and ask, can you give me a kiss on the cheek? Then, at the last moment, he would move his face, causing their lips to accidentally touch. I warned my girlfriend about this guy, and she witnessed his behavior herself. I advised her to be cautious if he approached her with the same request, noting that several girls had declined and he didn't push it further. Later on, the guy approached my girlfriend and made the same request. She pulled me aside to assure me that nothing would happen, and if he tried anything, she would step back to avoid the kiss. I expressed my discomfort and disagreement with the situation, emphasizing that I wouldn't take responsibility if she ended up kissing him. However, she disregarded my concerns and accepted. I wasn't surprised when she didn't step back as promised and ended up kissing him. I felt angry, not at the guy, but at her. I silently left for our apartment, and she followed, despite my not inviting her. She explained that she didn't have time to react and insisted it wasn't her fault. 
Since we were in a public setting, I chose not to cause a scene and waited until we were home to discuss further. After arriving home, I confronted her, emphasizing that it was entirely her fault. She witnessed the guy's behavior with other women, and I even warned her about the possibility, yet she still went along with it. She claimed alcohol made her act recklessly, but I refused to accept her excuses. I made it clear that her actions amounted to blatant infidelity. She left to visit her sister, whose birthday is today. I chose not to accompany her and explicitly expressed my desire to reassess our relationship. I explained that if she's going to use alcohol as an excuse for infidelity, then I can't trust her. If she's willing to do that in front of me, I dread to think what she might do when she's with her friends. Before leaving, she pleaded with me not to overreact, stating that I shouldn't throw away for years over a non-consensual kiss. I countered that by agreeing to play along with the guy's game, she had effectively given consent to whatever might happen. She's an adult, and I expected her to act accordingly. As time passes, my resolve to end things grows stronger. Our lease ends at the year's end, but I'm contemplating using our savings to terminate it early. I refuse to be with someone who can casually kiss a stranger at a party and expect me to be okay with it. Yet, the thought of ending the relationship saddens me. However, forgiving such a lack of respect would only invite more incidents like this in the future. My younger sister and parents support my decision, but my older brother, who is closest to me, believes it can be resolved. I'm torn about what to do. From his second-story bedroom window, Mike observed his wife, Christy, eagerly embracing Jake Williams, a man who claimed to be his best friend. It was their fifth date together, and as Mike listened, he overheard their plan to further humiliate him. He had expressed to Christy his desire to spend a whole week with her, but she hesitated. Not a whole week, Jake, she said. Maybe just a weekend, but under one condition. What's that? Jake inquired. You have to get Mike to foot the bill, she replied with a chuckle. That's absurd, Jake laughed. I'm much wealthier than he is. I'll cover the expenses. No, no, Christy insisted. You're missing the point of all this. And what's that? Jake asked. Humiliating Mike, Christy confessed. Admit it, you get a thrill out of putting him down, don't you? Making him feel worthless? Well, Jake hesitated. He is my best friend, you know. Stop lying, Christy retorted. You enjoy humiliating him almost as much as I do. Christy, let's stop this game, Jake urged. Leave him and come with me. I want to marry you and spend my life with you. Christy laughed. Tell you what, she teased. Let's have him pay for a wild weekend, and then we'll talk, okay? Jake sighed in frustration. It'll definitely be wild, he muttered as he got into his car. I'll be in touch, but don't keep me waiting too long. You're already giving me blue balls. Christy watched him drive off and then entered the house she shared with Mike. She began undressing, dropping her dress on the floor, revealing her nakedness. She headed upstairs, finding Mike in the bedroom. She walked into the bathroom, leaving the door open. You probably heard everything, she stated. I'm leaving you for Jake. We're going on a wild weekend, and you're paying for it. Soon, I'll be marrying him. I've been paying since we got married three years ago, Mike replied sadly. I thought we were happy. I've done nothing but love you. Don't you love me? Christy scoffed. How could I love you? She mocked. You're a coward who lets your best friend date your wife. She watched as he sniffled on the bed. Grow up, she snapped. Is that why you've been treating me poorly lately? He asked weakly. Why else? She responded. Seeing the lust in his eyes, she shook her head. Don't even think about it. You're not touching me with that pathetic little thing. I'm calling a real man over to satisfy me. Maybe you can watch or take notes. Perhaps I'll let you clean up after him. Damn you, Mike muttered, getting off the bed. He went downstairs, followed by Christy. Leaving to sulk somewhere, she taunted. Maybe cry to your mommy? Mike looked at her with sadness and determination. He had endured enough and vowed to take no more. Goodbye, Christy, he said firmly, slamming the door. 
Christy heard his car door slam and watched as he drove off. Where was he going? She shrugged. Good riddance, she thought. She grabbed her phone and dialed a number. Hey, lover, she purred. Wimpy is gone. Why don't you come over and have some fun? Three days later, Michael arrived home and parked in the driveway. He opened the garage door, pulled in, and closed it behind him. Carrying his briefcase, he entered the house without a word to Christy, who was seated at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee. Curious, Christy approached his office door and tried to open it, finding it locked, which was unusual. She knocked and heard the lock disengage before entering. Inside, she found Michael at his desk, engrossed in something on his computer, likely related to the housing track he was designing. What do you want? Michael asked sharply, surprising Christy. He had never spoken to her like that before. She realized she had been disrespectful to him lately. I was worried, she admitted. You've been gone for three days, and I couldn't reach you on your cell. I'm sure you were, he replied sarcastically. Christy sensed a difference in him, a coldness she hadn't seen before. She tried to initiate physical contact, but he rebuffed her. Can I at least get a kiss? she asked. He refused and asked her to leave, focusing on his computer once more. Confused, Christy left his office and retreated to the bedroom to call Jake. He's back, Christy told Jake on the phone. But something's off. He's like a different person. He wouldn't even kiss me. Don't worry, sweetheart, Jake reassured her. He's probably realized you're leaving him. I'll come over and talk to him. Just give me a few minutes. That evening, Jake arrived and Christy let him in. Jake requested to speak with Michael alone and headed to the office. Knocking on the door, he identified himself as Jake and asked to talk. Michael unlocked the door, allowing Jake to enter. Closed the door, Michael instructed as Jake entered the room. He gestured for Jake to sit down while he poured himself a drink. Aren't you going to offer me a drink? Jake inquired. Michael regarded him silently for a moment. Friend? Are you truly my friend? Michael questioned. Jake appeared puzzled. Christie's assessment was accurate. This was not the submissive, passive man he was accustomed to dealing with. Of course, Jake replied. I'm your best friend, remember? Michael chuckled softly. Best friend, he echoed. Let me ask you something. What kind of friend pursues his friend's wife? Mike, I apologize, Jake began, but Michael interrupted him. You desire Christy, correct? Michael inquired. Jake nodded. What is she worth to you? I'm not sure what you mean, Jake replied. Don't feign ignorance, Jake, Michael retorted. You're a shrewd businessman. You understand that every negotiation involves a price. How much? I don't know, Jake admitted. What are you proposing? I quite fancy your new Bentley, Michael remarked. How much did you pay for it? I spent over $500,000 on it, Jake revealed. And it's fully paid off, correct? Michael confirmed. Absolutely, Jake affirmed. That would be a suitable starting point, Michael stated. What? Jake exclaimed. You want me to surrender my Bentley in exchange for Christy? Michael grinned. As well as 25% of your net worth, Michael clarified. Jake's eyes widened. That's over $50 million, Jake exclaimed. You can't be serious. It's precisely $52,450,389.25, according to my calculations, Michael stated. And I am indeed serious. You're demanding my car and 25% of my net worth for Christy? Jake reiterated incredulously. Christie's assessment was accurate. This wasn't the man he was accustomed to dominating. This offer stands until noon tomorrow, Michael declared. After 12 o'clock, it increases to 50%, along with controlling shares of your company. You desire Christie, that's my price. That's outrageous, Jake protested. You'll never get away with it. Perhaps, perhaps not, Michael replied nonchalantly, taking a sip of his drink. 
You want her, although I can't fathom why, and that's my price. Tell you what, accept my offer without hesitation, and I'll ensure you and Christy spend the rest of your lives together. Isn't that what you desire? Well, yes, I do want to spend my life with Christy, Jake admitted. Michael smiled. Agree to this, and I'll even prepare a celebratory dinner for the two of you, Michael offered. What do you say? I'll need time to consider it, Jake responded. Michael nodded. You have until noon tomorrow, he stated. Now, please close the door on your way out. Jake left the room, bewildered. Michael watched from the window as Jake and Christy departed. He smiled and made a few phone calls. Christy returned home in the early hours of the morning. Michael overheard their conversation in the driveway. Just think, Jake said. In a couple of days, we'll start our new lives, free from Mike. Come on, let me come inside and have a taste of this, he added, attempting to touch Christy. She grinned and pushed his hand away. Very soon, she replied with anticipation. I can't wait to see Mike play the role of a waiter. She kissed him goodbye as he drove off. Entering the house, she noticed a light on in her husband's office. Had he been in there all this time? She wondered. Attempting to open the door, she found it locked. Mike, she called out. Leave me alone, Michael's voice came from inside. Deciding not to press further, Christy felt uneasy about her husband's unusual behavior and retreated to the master bedroom. The following day, Michael received a text from Jake, Deal. He promptly replied with an offshore account number, instructing Jake to transfer the agreed amount. After confirming the transfer, Michael swiftly redistributed the funds across multiple accounts under his control. He then messaged Jake and Christy, Dinner tonight, my treat. Arrive at 7 p.m. sharp. Preparing for the evening, Michael ventured out to gather ingredients for the meal. He enjoyed cooking, although tonight's occasion held a bittersweet sentiment. Christy arrived home around 6 p.m. and found Michael in the kitchen, where he seemed surprisingly adept at cooking. The aroma wafting from the kitchen was enticing. I didn't know you cooked, she remarked. Michael glanced at her before responding, there's much about me you don't know. Perhaps if you had been around more often, you would have learned but I've learned to fend for myself. With a tear forming in her eye, Christy retreated upstairs, grappling with remorse. Minutes before seven o'clock, Jake arrived and was greeted by Michael. Handing over the keys to the Bentley and signed documents, Jake exclaimed, as promised. I could use a drink, though. Thank you for honoring our agreement. Drinks will be served shortly, Michael acknowledged, pocketing the keys. Christy descended in a stunning dress, noticeably ringless. As they sat down for dinner, Michael served them lasagna and champagne, declining to join them. This meal is for you both. Enjoy, he stated before retiring to his office. Observing the clock, he awaited the inevitable. Moments later, he heard two thumps from the dining room, confirming his expectations. He quickly changed the tire and proceeded to prepare them, undressing both individuals and securing their arms and legs together with rope. Utilizing a wheeled cart from the garage, he then moved them outside, securing their unconscious bodies with weighted chains. To prevent any potential outcry, he inserted ball gags into their mouths before placing them inside a large canvas bag he had acquired for this specific purpose. Using the cart and a portable engine lift, he loaded them into the trunk of the Bentley, ensuring it was securely locked before departing. Upon reaching their destination several hours later, he observed movement from inside the bag and decided to address their concerns. With a small taser in hand, he offered to remove the gags if they agreed to remain silent. Upon the compliance, he removed the gags and proceeded to explain their situation. He revealed that they were at the exact location where Christie's husband had taken his own life, attributing his actions to the mistreatment he had endured at their hands. Introducing himself as Michael, the twin brother of Christie's late husband, he disclosed that while they shared many similarities, he had always been wary of Christie's intentions. He recounted his brother's unwavering love for her and his own concerns about her character. Christie expressed disbelief at the revelation of a twin brother, to which Michael explained that his existence had been kept hidden for undisclosed reasons. He humorously dismissed any further explanation, suggesting it was a matter he would rather not discuss. 
As he revealed their current location to be the depths of Bottomless Lake, where his brother had ended his life, Christy was overcome with emotion, tears streaming down her face. Did he really take his own life? She asked, disbelief coloring her voice. Michael's response was sharp. Don't play innocent, he retorted. You made it clear you didn't care for him. Your actions spoke louder than words, driving him to that edge. Turning to Jake, he continued with disdain. And you, pretending to be his loyal friend. What kind of friend betrays his own like that? Michael's tone was accusatory. You used him, reveling in his humiliation and pain. But you promised we'd be together, Jake interjected, his tone pleading. You deceived me. You cheated. I said you'd be together for the rest of your lives, Michael corrected, a cold smirk playing on his lips. I just didn't mention it'd be a short-lived reunion. A fitting end for those who conspired against my brother. Please, have mercy, Christy implored, desperation in her voice. Michael met her gaze evenly. My brother begged for mercy too, he stated bluntly. But you showed him none. Now it's your turn. You're insane, Christy protested, her voice trembling. Michael remained unfazed. Perhaps, he conceded. But your farewell note will paint a different picture. As for the lake's depth, let's just say it's deep enough to keep your secrets buried. With a final push, Michael tipped the bag into the water, watching as they struggled against the weight dragging them down. He left them to their fate, the bubbles marking their descent. Returning to shore, he disposed of any evidence, then texted a confirmation of completion. The swift response brought a smirk to Michael's face. Thanks, bro, enjoy the ride. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel not to miss new videos.